All right, guys. Uh, last talk for the day. Uh, this one is by Terefam Hanschmidt, who contacted me uh, just nine months ago or something like that. And he wanted to do an internship at Namtide because he wanted to work on Next. And then uh, we organized a fundraiser. We were really surprised by the <laughs> generosity of the community. And now he's going to talk to you about what he really wanted to do, which is typing Next. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is indeed the result of the internship I did uh, with the help of Jonas and Twig.io. So uh, the goal of this internship was to design a type system for Nix. So the first obvious question is, why do we want to do that? So uh, there are two reasons for that. The first one is that, well, before being that awesome tool that everyone here uses, uh, Nix was a nice experiment. Which, well, the idea was, well, there are really cool stuff in programming languages. What if we use it somewhere else, like package management? And so Nix imported stuff like functional programming, immutability, and so on. And it worked very well. But there's something that Nix didn't broke, and which is quite pervasive in programming, which is static typing. So it should be a natural extension to try to add typing to this and see where it leads. And there's also a more pragmatic reason, which is that, well, Nix packages start to be quite big. So I measured around 1 million lines of code. And when you have a code base that big, you got errors, and they can be rather hard to spot. And that's where typing can help a lot. And so if uh, typing is so useful, the second question is, why didn't anybody design a type system for Nix? Uh, the reason, the main reason, I think, is that it's not totally obvious to do. If you look, for example, at this function, so it's uh, totally valid Nix code. You take a function, which take an argument. You look at the first elements of the argument, which uh, probably it's supposed to be a list. If the first one is a string, you try to access to the field of the second one, which is the value of this string. Otherwise, you do the sum of both. Well, that's a made-up example. I hope nobody's writing things like that. But uh, you can do that in Nix, and if you try to write a type for this function, even by hand, uh, you start be becoming mad and uh, know that, well, so that's not totally trivial to do. And uh, the second reason it hasn't been done yet, well, I quickly mention it. Uh, Nix packages start being quite big. So I measured it last week. You got 1 million lines of code. Probably 90% 90, 90 of it are Nix, actual Nix code. And so uh, probably not of it is going to type check at once or probably almost nothing of it is going to type check. So that means that the type system or the type checker must be really flexible if you want to be able to run it on Nix packages without uh, it to crash at the first line of code it reads. So um, we tried to do it. Uh, the requirement for this, well, the first one requirement is that we didn't want to write a new language which was well typed and which could compile to Nix code. I mean, that's a valid idea, but uh, if you do that, you can't use it on actual Nix code, and you, you, that's kind of sad because, well, you don't want to rewrite Nix packages in a new language. Uh, no. Um, and as a consequence of it, we didn't want to extend Nix syntax. In particular, we, if, we want, if we had Nix annotation, it must be valid Nix code. And uh, the two last requirements are first, well, obviously that we want to type as much code as possible while still being safe. And the other one, which is kind of weird, is that even the code that's not well typed it must still be ac somehow accepted by the type checker. Because, well, as I said, you probably won't get uh, the whole of mixed packages to type check whatever your type system is. 
or maybe you can if your type system is just okay everybody type check but that's not really useful but anyway we want to be able to say that ill typed code must be accepted by the type checker so that's where our requirements and hopefully what we came up with more or less satisfy this so um, to satisfy the especially the third requirement we need a quite powerful type system so uh, this is another nix function more reasonable than the first one i showed what the, does it do it takes two arguments if the first one is an integer it makes the sum of both otherwise it makes the boolean end so if you want to type this we're going to be quite stuck because well it's if it has types int a row int a row int yeah but it also has type bool a row bool a row bool and you can't really unify the both i mean how do we ex express the type of this well we can ask for help uh, to uh, bavic mathematic theory which is set theory if we look at set theory things are actually quite easy you want something to pick an element which is in the set a and in the set b well life is simple you just take an element which is in the intersection of both Oops, sorry actually well we can do almost the same thing with types well just we're a type theorist we like to give new names for all things so we're going to rename the symbols instead of union intersection we're going to type the boolean and and or instead of set containment we're going to take a subtyping relation but essentially this is the, the same thing so and uh, using set theory we get for free uh, singleton types so types with only one element for example the singleton type one which has only the constant one as an element and others which uh, are going to be quite helpful and uh, with this notion of types we can type our f function it will simply have the intersection of both type we wanted to express so we are happy we can type a lot of stuff with that but uh, that's not going to be enough because there's still something that we can't type i mean if everything was that, of that shape that would be simple but that's not the case so we add another element to our type system which is a gradual typing <coughs> so gradual typing is a way to to express the fact that you can't type something so you add a new type which is generally a question mark which represents your the type that you don't know and we can which can be used to type expressions that you're not supposed to type so in this example uh, the value of x uh, can be any string because it's the value of the environment variable x so when we try to access to the field x of this record well uh, it's supposed to be to fail or except in the very special case where x is equal to y so this is not supposed to type check but if we want this to type check because it's already there and we don't want to change it we can say the type to the type checker okay x will have type question mark and so don't bother what it is whenever you have to use x just assume that it has the right type and it works um, so we are happy we have a very expressive uh, definition for our types which can be used to represent more or less everything in x packages because when we can't express the type we want we just say it's gradual and we don't care but of course the problem with it is that well we can't always infer the types if for example we try to run our type checker on the first example well obviously you want it to answer oh it's easy it's a function from integers to integers but actually it, it will just say no it's a function that takes something i don't know what but which returns an integer if you take the second one it will also say that it accepts something but don't know why <laughs> don't know what and it will return either an int either a bool well that's the cool part at least that's precise so basically what the type checker does when he sees that he says okay yeah, it's a function 
it takes an argument, but I don't know anything about this argument, so I'm going to assume it's gradual. And then you will try to type check the body of the function and infer a type for it. So we need to help him, and we can help him. We can uh, annotate the types. So uh, this, the syntax for type annotation is just wrap into comments so that uh, Nix doesn't, uh, doesn't see them and can continue to evaluate the file. And here we say, OK, x is of type int, and uh, the type checker type checks the function as it should. We can do the same with the second function, and it says that it's a function that takes an integer or, or a Boolean and returns an integer or a Boolean. But in fact, that's not what we want either, because this function uh, what these types mean is that if this function takes an integer, it will, it will return either an integer, either a boolean, which is true, but not really useful. In reality, if this function takes an integer, it will return an integer. And if it takes a boolean, it will return a boolean. So that's not the most precise type we, we are going to give to this function. And we don't want to have unprecise types, because otherwise the type system is just useless. So we need to help him further. And to do that, uh, there's a wonderful technique called uh, bidirectional typing, which can give, help us giving a more precise type to this function. Uh, to explain what it is, I'll just quickly explain how most traditional type checking algorithms work. So uh, let's assume you get an expression. This is a syntactic tree for an expression, so it's a function uh, which takes two arguments, x and y, and return x plus y, or the plus function applied to x and y. Um, traditional type checking algorithms will type check this bottom up, so first trying to infer the type of the leaves, and then go up in the trees until you have the type of the whole expression. So for example, uh, the algorithm first will check the type of plus. He will say, okay, I know plus, it's a function, it's in my environment, it has type int, row int, row int. Then it will check, it will check x, it will check, oh, okay, x, it has a, I know it's in my environment because it has been defined before. I don't know its type yet. Let's call it tx. And then he'll go one step above and he will say, okay, we can have this type check if we say that tx is equal to int, in which case we can apply uh, plus to x, and the result will have int or in, int or int. So it will give this the type int or int, and it will add somewhere as a constraint that tx is equal to int. Then he will do the same with uh, how with y, saying oh it has type ty. Then it will do the application, saying, OK, it type checks is ty is equal to int, and the result has type int. OK, that's good. Then one step above, OK, this is a function. So it will have type int or int, because if y is an int, it will return an int. And still one step above, if it's going to be a function of type int or int or int. OK, that's cool. So now let's look at the function we had before. So this is its expression tree, it's a function which uh, actually, it's not the function we had before, it's a simpler one. So it's a function which takes an argument x, if x isn't, uh, well, if isn't x then it will return minus minus x, else it will return not x. And if we try to type check this using the same method, we're gonna have a problem because the algorithm will say, OK, I got minus applied to x, so x is an integer. OK, I got not applied to x, so x is a Boolean. So x is at the same time a Boolean and an integer. No, that, that doesn't work. But let's assume that the type checker already knows the type of this expression. Because, for example, uh, the programmer gave him a type annotation. He will say, OK, I know that this is supposed to have type int or int intersection bool or bool. How can I check that? Well, to do that, first we get an intersection of arrows. That means that we're in both, er in both arrows. So let's try the first one. This is a function. 
So that means that if x has type in, then the body has type int. OK, how do I check that this has the right type? Uh, this is an if then else. So I'll try to infer the type of the condition. What is the type of this? So, well, we just do like we did before, classic inference. We know the type of the easy int function. It's a function that returns the singleton type true if its argument is of type int, and which returns the singleton type false if its argument is of type not x. The little stuff like is a Boolean negation. We also know the type of x because we decided that it will be an int. So we know the type of this. It's of type true, the singleton type true. OK, we can continue. We're going to check that uh, minus x has type int. Well, that's trivial. We know that x has type int, minus x has type int. And now we're going to check that, no, we're not going to check that not x has type int because we know that uh, this, uh, the condition is always going to be true. So we don't have a check for the second branch because it's never going to be reached. So we are done. We've checked that this function has the right uh, type. Now we do the same with the second with the second type in the intersection. We suppose that x is a bool, blah blah blah. It's exactly the same thing. And at the end, we're happy. We've type checked this function, and uh, we can indeed run it on an example. And the type checker will be happy and say, "Yeah, it's inter int intersection bool error bool." So we are really happy. We now got a powerful system which can, whose types can express a lot of things and which can infer or check a lot of things too. In fact, um, the bidirectional typing can give us even more. Because if you look at this expression, though, so what do we have here? We got a function that takes an argument x of type int and that returns the, the identity function applied to x. Now, if we try to annotate it, saying that the argument is supposed to be of type int and the return is supposed to be of type bool, well, you would expect the type checker to complain that it's false because when you apply the identity function to an int, you want to get an int as a result. But in fact, it's going to pass. The reason for this is that um, the y colon y function, which is the identity function, will be typed as question mark or question mark because, well, it's not annotated. The type checker can't guess its type. So by default, it's going to type it gradually. So uh, x is an int. It can be passed as an argument for, to a function which expects anything. And the result of this application is going to be of type uh, gradual and gradual can be passed where you expect a bool, so it's fine. Now, uh, if we rewrite this using uh, bidirectional typing, so we give the type of the function to the type checker, then it's going to fail because um, the type checker, so it will do at the beginning the same thing, assume that x is an int, trying to give a type to the body, but inside of inferring it, is going to try to check that the body has type bool. And to do that, well, he knows that x has type int, so he's going to check that the identity function has type int or a bool, which means checking that if y is an int, then y is a bool. And well, that he's able to guess that it's wrong. <laughs> so thanks to this bidirectional typing stuff, we get more precision and, well, that may not seem like a big deal, but the really nice thing is that um, if your types, if you do not annotate your code, well, the type checker will be very lax and he will say, okay, this is not annotated. Let's, let's say that everything is gradually typed and uh, more or less every code you could imagine writing is going to pass. But if you somewhere put an annotation, then the type checker will have some, in, some type information that, we, we have, that he will be able to propagate down in the, in the expression. And if you have an actual type error, there it will have enough information to catch it. 
So that makes a natural way of separating code that you want to type from code that you don't want to type. And it's probably very practical in practice. So hopefully we satisfied our requirements for a simplified Nix language. Now Nix has more stuff, in particular lists and arrays, so we'll have to type these too. For lists, well, the problem with Nix style lists is that they can have elements of different types in it, which is um, which can be useful in practice, that's why it is, but which not that easy to type. Well, uh, in fact, uh, when you want to represent, uh, to, to describe some checks of text, there's a powerful tool, which is regular expressions. Well, Nicolas showed us how regular expressions can be wonderful. <laughs> and in fact, you can have the same with types. So you can type a list using a regular expression that represents its elements. So for example, the first list here, went to true, can have the type uh, in star, so any sequence of int, followed by the singleton type true, followed by the optional, uh, the sharp here is, uh, is what's usually a question mark in regexes, but question mark is already taken by the gradual type. So followed by the optional bar string. So this first list will have this type. The second list is another uh, element of this type, although it's quite different. Indeed, it has a sequence of int, in this case zero ints, followed by true, followed by the optional bar, which is in this case present. Um, this general form is probably not useful or not often useful because you don't want to write, to have a function that accepts any list that has this shape. I don't know what you, well, maybe you have ideas what you would want, want to do with this, but I don't. But uh, there are, the cool stuff is that first, you can express um, the regular monomorphic list using this, a list of whose elements will be of type A will just be a list of type A star. And uh, although Nix has no tuples, you can express tuples using this. For example, the list of type int bool, the type uh, list int bool will be the type of all list with two elements, the first being an int and the second the bool. So this is almost the same as the tuple int bool, which can be handy if you want to use tuples and have them well typed. Okay, so lists were fairly well. Now let's look at attribute sets. Um, there are several ways attribute sets are used in Nix, at least two that I know of. The first one is what I call static attribute set. So that when you know everything about your labels, so in this case, for example, you know that this attribute set will have three fields, X, Y, and Z. You, we know their names, we know everything. So this has a trivial type, which is itself, but as a type. So that's really easy to do. Cool, we're happy. No, we can be a little bit more fancy. Let's look at this function. So it, it takes an argument, an attribute set, which must have an element x, may have an element y, may have anything else. Well, we also can type it. Uh, how we would we type it? Well, we will say that its argument must be a record with the first element x, which is an int. The second element y, which may be present or not, that's what the equal question mark means. And if it's present, it must be an int, and which may have anything else after that. So we can express this kind of thing. Now, in Nix, we can do some much weirder stuff. So for example, let's look at this attribute set. It has probably two fields, uh, but we don't know what their labels are. We we know that there are going to be strings, otherwise it wouldn't be valid, but we don't really know. So all we can say is that it's going to be a record where if you try to access a field, well, maybe it's going to be absent, or maybe it's going to be present, in which case it will be either one or true. 
So that's all you can say about this record, and we're quite happy because we can express this in this type system. So we can extend our type system to manage these data structures, and we are really happy about this. Uh, the problem is that, well, I show you the example with the x colon x function, which is in fact an unsafe case. You can cast any value to any type without any problem. The type checker will say, okay, okay, no problem, I, I close my eyes, do it. And uh, well, sometimes it's, well, it's cool. It's practical when you, the, when you don't want to bother about the typing, but most of the time you don't want that. So you want to be able to tell the type checker, okay, if you could be just a little bit more strict so that this doesn't pass, it will be very nice. So for this, we added a strict mode to the type checker. So this is basically a simpler version of the example I showed. It's gonna type check. Now we can say to the type checker, okay, this is gonna be type check in strict mode. And in this case, it's not gonna pass. The type checker is gonna say, okay, I got a function x colon x. I don't know anything about its argument. Let's say it's of type any. So any is the type I don't know anything about. So the result is gonna be of type any. But any is a type I don't know anything about. So in particular, I don't know if it's a bool or not. So I'm just gonna fail. And we're happy because that's what we wanted. And if we want, and this, that means that if we want that kind of thing to type check, well, no, no, that, not that kind of thing. But if we want to be able to use function in an effective way, we'll have to annotate them and we can just let uh, unsafe checks pass without noticing. Another feature of uh, the strict mode is that, well, if you remember the examples that I showed you about the record, or this one, which is almost the same, well, this type checks, it will say that it's a record, which we don't know about the labels and so on. But if X and Y, in fact, are the same thing, well, evaluate to the same values, this is not going to be accepted by the evaluator. He's going to say, oh, no, I got a record with, where the same field is defined twice. This is not valid and so on. So in strict mode, we also want to disable this. And in fact, if the type checker is not able to infer that all the fields will be distinct, he's not, he's just going to yell at you and output an error. So likewise, that's not some, something we want by default because you may gonna encounter this and sometimes you want to write this. But if you're in a play that you control, you may want to avoid this. Now we can even go a little bit further. So this is always the same example, really cool example actually. I can use it everywhere, it's really handy. Uh, so this type checks. Now uh, we can say to the, the type checker, okay, I want to disable the special effect of the gradual type here. So it's gonna raise an error because cast will still be of type question mark or question mark. But now when we get this no gradual annotation, uh, the question mark is gonna lose its special features and just become a regular type like int, like bool, like string. And so, in particular, an int is not going to be uh, a gradual type. Uh, the gradual type is not going to be a Boolean. And so this is going to fail. And of course, as we want to use, uh, even if we disable the gradual type, we still have to use functions from the outside world, which sometimes are gradually typing. We will add a, a couple of functions which allow you to explicitly insert the implicit casts that were added by the gradual type. So if you want to type check this, you still can. Well, it's not, uh, I wouldn't then advise you to do that because it's false, but you can do it and you can use functions from the untyped world that are coming to you super tight module with no gradual type. So uh, the, the nice thing about it is that you can have a right wide range of uh, strictness going from the default mode where 
almost every code is going to type check. Then you can add some annotations to restrict the amount, the, the amount of code that type checks. And you can add some strict or no gradual annotations to get some really strict code that, well, if it type checks, you're quite confident that it's going to run without errors. So currently, that's more or less all. Uh, there's a POC and a implementation that I wrote for my <coughs> internship in OKML. Uh, almost all the type system is implemented, but, uh, well, I wrote uh, the parser very quickly. It's probably really buggy. Uh, not probably, I know it's buggy, and it works on toy examples, but that's all. And I've started a new rewrite in Haskell to use uh, HNICs to avoid having to write my own parser because that's not the kind of stu stuff I enjoy. And, uh, but uh, now that uh, my internship is over, I don't have uh, the possibility to work on this full time anymore, so I'm going to need some help. And that's where you could help by participating to the development of this and by testing it while it's going to be in, uh, as soon as it's in a state where it's stay stable, because the development is just at the beginning. So you're all uh, warmly welcome to come and help for, for the development of the implementation. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to say awesome work. Uh, I see some very complicated challenges in, indeed in the Nix type system. Um, have you thought about the actual error messages uh, themselves? Uh, do you have examples or is that not written yet? Uh, well, there are error messages, but they are not really interesting now. This is some part I haven't really time to work on because I had to focus on the purely typing part. But that's a really important part, I agree, and yeah, it will well, deserve a lot of work, especially since the type system is somewhat complicated. Uh, if we got bad error messages, it's going to be unusable. Yeah. Great work, nonetheless. Thanks. Are you aware of any experiments of uh, using new DAL language with Nix? Like, have you heard of it? I think it's a uh, uh, language uh, for configurations uh, with dependent times by Gabriel Gonzalez. Yeah. Um, DAL, well, it's, it's an interesting experiment too, but quite different because, yeah. well, one of my first requirements was explicitly not to write a new language that will yeah. compile to Nix because, uh, well, nobody would like to rewrite the whole Nix packages in DAL, uh, especially since it's not possible for technical reasons. Uh, but DAL is also interesting if you want to write your own private stuff. Uh, they just don't have the same application field, I think. No. Uh, so if I if I write next code, the, sort of the primary thing that I'm actually missing in terms of type systems is to make differences between things that are otherwise com considered equal, something like new type and Haskell. So you took the gradual typing approach here. Do you do you have any vision on like how that could ever be extended with something like user defined data types? Um, the problem with user-defined data types or new type is that it's quite hard to do without extending the language it itself. So that's why I didn't work on it at all. Uh, it would be a great improvement, <coughs> but uh, it probably requires changes in the language that uh, were out of scope for this. Is Did you work on any polymorphic types yet? <laughs> That's a question I don't want to hear. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, mm, there's no polymorphism yet, uh, especially because it doesn't work well with the gradual typing stuff. 
Um, actually, uh, the set theoretic types, which serve as a basis for all the rest, uh, have been recently extended with polymorphism. So hopefully, uh, we'll be able to work it out and add polymorphism to this. But uh, that's not done yet. And I, I don't know if it's going to be possible anytime soon. Well, you still have some bounded polymorphism because you can say that uh, your identity function has type int or int, intersection, bool or bool, intersection, string or string, but uh, you can't have an infinite polymorphism. Maybe if you can infer it, you can still check it. Uh, there's more or less, not in the general case, so we could have some hacks or, but we could check it in some cases, but after that it's, use, it's not easy to, to use. If you have a polymorphic function, you don't always know how you're gonna instantiate your types when you try to apply it. So, well, it's still a research topic. Yeah. What does your type checker say about the very awesome function lambda x, uh, if x less than 5, then x else lambda y, x plus y? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, if you gave him the right annotations, uh, he's going to say really cool things. Because uh, one nice thing with uh, set theoretic types that I didn't mention is that you have singleton types, but you can also have arbitrary interval types. So you can have the type for all integers that are greater than 5 for example. So uh, I don't remember exactly what your function is, but... Well, it takes the second argument if x is greater than 5. Yeah, so, so it's going to type it as uh, uh, the, set, the intervals of integers that are greater than 5 euro uh, int, if I remember correctly. Intersection, uh, all the other integers, euro something, euro something. But I think it can type check it quite effectively. But I also think you don't want to write that function in practice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question. Maybe Elko wants to say something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think this is the last question. Very simple question. What is the runtime complexity of the current typing system that you have? Is it just linear? It's uh, mostly linear because we're just training through the ice, through the syntactic tree, and we are not trying to reconstruct anything. So uh, it can be, well, it's not exactly linear because if you have uh, intersection types, you can have to check uh, many times the same code path and Probably if you write uh, complex enough types, it can blow up, but, uh, well, at most I'd say it's quadratic. I didn't uh, exactly check it, but. Yeah, and just in the same direction, do you have, did you already, made any, any, did you already make any kind of uh, performance evaluations, whether it can very quickly type some, an expression that is as large as Nick's packages, or is this something that, uh, would still have to be done. Um, I tried to do some, um, some time measurements. The problem is that um, my parser that I wrote uh, probably with my feet or I don't know how, but it was itself so slow that uh, only parsing a file took uh, several seconds and was longer than the type checking itself. So, <laughs> no. All right, thank you. Oh, and I forgot the most important part of this talk, which was to say thank you to everyone who donated to the crowdfunding campaign, because it's really helped a lot. Thank you. <laughs>